from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This will be our final episode covering the topic of Mahjong. We've started from the core basic concepts and we've really expanded it out. So I'm going to show you a couple more really cool things about this game and talk a little bit about some of the other games that are out there as well. Let's get stuck in. For this last episode, I'm going to do something a little different. I've referenced scoring and valid hands all through the game, and I've even mentioned in a previous episode of how many points one thing was worth versus a not. In the simple concept of Han and Yaku. So let's take the time to really go into it. And this is something where, let me just go ahead and say, you can absolutely find something online that will show you in a printout all the valid hands, or the most common valid hands. But this is the core of the game, is finding not just the sequences and straights as a part of the melds, but finding them in unique combinations and increasingly complex options. This is why even through all the practice games we've done so far, none of them have reached the end where we had to worry about tempi rules, even though we've talked about it at length. So. I want to show you exactly what some of these hands are, how much they're worth, and how to calculate. I will also say you can typically find a calculator app for how to calculate these points. I will show you the process, but there is that option available. You also need to know how much each hand is worth, and sometimes you don't have that. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to have my notes in front of me, I'll freely concede that, and all of the tiles here. And courtesy of our overhead view, you'll be able to see what these hands are and how they look. So the easiest way that we've referred to, because uh, remember, it's still got to be melds, uh, and we're going to do it like this. So two, three, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, and we'll do a pair of eights. So for our hand here, we've got a lot of points because it involves a couple different combinations. First off, we have our, like we had in our previous game, that two consecutive straights. And it's even more important because we have not one, but two sets of them. So this is actually going to be what's called a twice pure double straight. Instead of this being worth one individually, one, two, it's actually going to be worth three. Why? Because of the fact that it is a more difficult hand to achieve. So it scales. Now let's also note that it is all of the same suit. That is, especially if it's closed, this is where the closed makes a difference. So we've got three Han in the first place, all simples for Han. Now we have something that is only from one suit, which, if it is open, is worth five Han. If it's closed, it's worth six. This makes a difference with minutia because once you get up to a certain point, you can actually stop counting, which is part of my favorite bit of this. There are some games where they want you to keep track of all the scoring, but here's the basic concept that you need to understand. Anything past five Han, you can stop counting until you figure out exactly how many you have, because the sub points are not going to matter. Having five Han, and for purpose of explanation, each player starts off with 25,000 points, which I know sounds like a lot, but having a five Han hand is worth 8,000 points. This is where I bring you back to the difference between a Ron, in which one player is eating all of the points because they're the one who dealt in, or Sumo, where it was self-drawn. This is where sometimes the points get weird. 
because if you're the dealer, it's worth slightly more. If you're not the dealer, you eat more of that points loss. So say it was worth 8,000 points. The dealer, if it's done off of Sumo, will lose 4,000 points. The remaining two players will lose 2,000 points. This is why finding a chart online makes it so much easier. But we'll go back to this. So we're already up to about seven Han, which after five Han, six and seven are worth 12,000 points. Eight, nine, and 10 are worth 16,000 points. 11 and 12, 24. And 13 are only gonna be for the rarest of hands. They're worth 32,000 points. You can win an entire game in one hand if you have the right combination, but that's why it's so difficult because they're so rare. So we'll keep counting this as though it's any sort of different. So let's truly make it as difficult as we possibly can. So we were up to eight Han previously. Uh, actually nine Han already. And then let's truly make it difficult. Let's say you did a reachy bet. The reach that I referred to at the very beginning. That's worth one Han on its own. Let's say, this is where you get into the weird circumstantial ones. Let's say after your discard, you discard a piece, I say that I'm reaching, and then before my next turn that piece gets drawn, it's double reachy, which is worth two Han. So it's these situational ones that add up over the course of time. This is where a chart really comes in help. But I wanna make sure that it's discussed about the different ways that this can work. So just off of that alone, let's say it was the twice pure double straight, it was closed, it's a full flush, it was double reachy. It, uh, you can add it up here to where it will now just be worth so many points. And especially if someone dealt in, unless they have 32,000 points, it's over. I will give this important caveat on why the points is a good idea to keep track of. Let's say that you have this massive hand and you take it away from somebody and you get the 32,000 points. If somebody has higher number of points than you, they can still win. You might not get first place just based solely on having a whole bunch of valid hands and of them being high quality. It's about winning the most and playing a lot of that strategy. Hence why sometimes people will have to go, especially in tournaments, for really risky hands that may or may not pay off. So this is just the simple scoring of a hand as a concept. And talking about the Han and after five, you can stop. I have to go into a little more detail, but for that, I wanna take a step back, take a moment, and then we will get into the next level Foo. So last time I talked about Mahjong, the two words with two G's. That was primarily among the Jewish demographic. One important rule set discussion was the introduction of the Charleston rule, which yes, is about the same time as the dance Charleston taking off. How you would handle it is at the very beginning of the game, you would take a piece that you didn't want, hand it to the player to your right, and they would do subsequently until everybody had some tiles that they had been able to theoretically improve their hand on while also getting rid of one they didn't want before they drew anything off the board. It's a fun little way to add to it if you want to play by that rule and you would probably be able to pick up more people who'd be willing to play the game if you make it a little easier at the beginning. But a little more on our modern Mahjong game in a minute. Now let's get from the Han to the Fu. So you figure out how much Han you have and it doesn't meet the five because it's not enough or it's just simplistic stuff like the uh, 
triple dragons is only worth one Han. The triple wins is only worth one Han. So let's say we're gonna have you at three Han. And let's say you're the dealer and you've won. And you've won off of somebody else's discard. So let's keep that in mind. It entirely depends on what you won on and how you won. Remember how I've been saying all across this time that having triplets is more important than the sequences? This is where that comes into play. So let me you know, bring out, we'll bring out the dots here. Two, three, four. We'll bring out all of them to highlight the example. So obviously, if you had all two, three, fours, sequences will not matter in terms of our counting of the food. This is all simples, so we don't have to worry about terminals for the count. So if you had this, and let's say maybe they were of different suits, but just for illustration here, each sequence is worth zero of the foo. Foo are these little mini points that help us determine how complex your hand was even if you didn't get the major valid hand. But this is how you can also get a lot of little points to add up really quickly. So if you have just a simple, simple hand, one off of somebody else, we start off with 20, 20 foo. Each subsequent number that you get is rounded up to 10. So we're gonna go to the nearest 10, you won't lose any. But if you get 22, that instantly becomes 30. If you have 34, that instantly becomes 40. If you have 48, that becomes 50. All the way up. Past 70 foo, we don't really count, um, just because that's really infrequent. So let's say you had 20. Uh, if you got it from somebody else and it was closed, so it's wrong and your hand was closed, that's worth 10. Just keep that in mind. A self-drawn sumo is only worth two. So there's still the advantage of being closed, but it's not gonna be as much. Now, if it's that, we talked about that seven pairs hand in last episode, and that is worth just by default 25 foo. Keep calm, carry on. You will go automatically to it. It'll be 30 foo. But, you won't get any bonus foo off of it really because they're only pairs. So now we need to go into what's the triplicates. So we'll do the, let's say our hand here is some triplicates and a sequence. So let's go off of this. If it's a triplet, the entire group is worth two, two of these foo. If you had them yourself, you multiply that by two, which makes it four. If it is a triplicate, it's worth times two. So what you can have here is you're gonna have two foo, that if it's closed, times two, four, times two, eight. So off of that, you can, in theory, this is where the terminals are harder, but if you get them, and you get them in triplicate, they can be worth a lot of points very quickly. This is where if you have a whole bunch of triplicates and they're all in ones and nines, you're gonna be doing pretty well for yourself. I will also say if it's a wind, if it's a dragon, that counts as the terminal as well. If it's a four of a kind, say you've got a con over the course, it's multiplied by four. So if you had that triplet Call, not called, it's a terminal, and it's a con. Now you've got, let's see, that's two times two, which is four, times two, which is eight, times four. You can go all the way up to 32 just off of those four alone. This is why when you're constructing your hand, you gotta really think about how to maximize those points. Also for the weight, so the last piece you need factors in here. 
If you needed for your winning tile that you were waiting on a single thing, so an eight, nine, and you're waiting on a seven, or a two, four, you're waiting on a three, that's worth two, two of these foo mini points. If you're waiting on a pair, that's also worth two foo. If the pair is a dragon or a seat wind or round wind, those are worth two foo. If it's your seat and it's your round, it's times two, so four. This is why having a little chart will absolutely help, but I'm 100% making sure that you've heard at least the initial concept of why this can add up fairly quickly. So from here, this is where we talk about the uh, exhaustive draw, the ready status hands. So it entirely depends on who is ready or not. If there's one person that's ready, three people there's not. Each player will give 1,000 points to the person who is ready. If it's two people ready, one person not, it's 1,500 exchanged over. If it's three people are ready, one person isn't, that person pays out 3,000, the other three get 1,000. This is where you would then also add to the pot. If you have to go again, you will repeat the hand, especially if the dealer was ready, it treats as though they won the hand. You will continue going and you will continue upping the stakes until somebody wins the hand. It further increases if somebody reached and you got to the exhaustive. Because what can happen is if you make a reachy bet and you lose, you also lose your bet. So this is where you gotta also factor in through the course of the game. So now you get into your chart and here's the last big difference maker here. If you're the dealer, basically your points are worth 1.5 versus the other players. This is where that banker bit comes into play. So let's say that your hand uh, ended up being five Han, and it would be 8,000 for everybody else. If you win it off of a Ron and you're the dealer, it's actually worth 12,000. If you win it off of self-draw, it's 4,000 from the other players each. So it's 1.5, always keep that in mind. That's why it's so advantageous if you're the dealer to maximize your potential and keep it going as long as possible. Because when you lose it, you will end up paying extra out and it will continue on. So this would be a section that I'd encourage to maybe watch more than once. I've tried to take it piece by piece. Uh, you can find some online resources of just a simple chart and it will take you through it. And if you have this chart and some simple hands, you will be well on your way and good to go. So I'll take one step back and I wanna talk about some of the fancier hands. I referenced the big 13 Han hands. We need to talk about Yakuman. So let me talk about our modern game. Now that we've reached kind of the current day, there are, my always favorite thing to talk about, tournaments. There are national and international tournaments for multiple different types of Mahjong. Either Rishi Mahjong, which we have been talking about, uh, Singapore Mahjong, the American Mahjong with the Charleston rules that I referred to previously. There's also quite a few online resources for how to play and being able to play with people all around the world. And especially during the shutdown, people were looking for things to do and Mahjong saw a new set of popularity. I wanted to talk about those big scoring hands, mostly because I want you to see the complexity that's required in order to get them. So from here, we will talk about, first off, typically wins end up playing a factor but first off, having a hand, go through this piece by piece here. I've mentioned before about the dragons factoring in. So having just one of these is enough for a valid hand. But having a triplet of all three 
is instantly that uh, Yakuman that I've referred to. It is a huge point hand because of how rare it is and how unlikely it is in the grand scheme of things. The difference here also is, let's say you had just a pair of one of them. That is worth two Han on its own. So you could have this and be waiting for it, especially if you're waiting for that last one as a discard. It instantly goes from a couple thousand points to a lot of points very quickly. Uh, another good hand is also, um, go ahead and keep this out, is a hand that is just entirely made up of terminals, regardless of it's your seat, regardless of the round, as long as it's all terminals and honors, that's Yakuman too. Uh, let's see, I'll go ahead and talk about the wins next. Because the wins ones can be really interesting. Uh, so we've got basically similar to last time, we talked about the basically little and big. There's similar instance here of if you have all four of the directional winds and only a pair as a part of it, that is the little four winds. It's basically the same if you have all four, but it's easier to you know complete a hand especially because by that point, it does not really matter what your pair is, or it doesn't matter what your other triplicate is, as long as you have this base amount. So that's where getting the valid hand is one part of it. It's also getting the rest of the elements together and showing that you at least have that core amount. So of the wins, and you've got honors, we also have the all terminals can't have a single two through eight, and you can't have a single honor. So no dragons, no wins, just all ones and nines is another instant Yakman. Another one of my favorites is it involves the green dragon. And I want you to notice that on here, the one, the five, the seven, and the nine all have little red marks on them. So this particular Yakuman is called All Green. It can only be twos, threes, fours, sixes, eights, and green dragons. That is also an instant Yakuman. Notice how these seem preposterously difficult, right? That is where we get into the issue of trying to get everything taken care of. Uh, if you also have four of those Khan, that's also a Yakuman. So notice how it adds up, and all of these are available by being open. That is the kind of nice part, is that any of these can be achieved while also declaring. It's instant points. Now we need to talk about the ones that aren't able to be stolen from. So I talked before about if you get a hand instantly. Any Valen hand, just off of the deal, as the dealer, that's a Yakuman. Any sort of first draw is also a Yakuman. So we need to talk about a couple. First of all, the four concealed triplets. So it's exactly as it says on the tin. This, in the last game, there were open ones. If they had all been closed, it would have been an instant Yakuman doesn't matter the other bits. It doesn't matter that there were dragons involved. Four concealed triplets is an instant Yakuman. We also need to talk about two last ones. What are referred to as, and this can be in any suit, but I'm going to use the characters for this one. What are called the nine gates. So the nine gates is a specific number combination. Two... Uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is basically a straight that is 
It's a triplicate of the terminals, the ones and nines. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So basically another straight. And then one of literally any other tile in the suit. It could be anywhere from the one to eight range. That would be an instant, instant win. Uh, and then also, by extension, instant Yakuman. That is, again, another one of those really hard hands to hit, but if you can get there. The last one, though, is probably, it's the most well-known, that's for sure. Um, and it's also, by extension, uh, the hardest to get, pretty much, because it's straight up off of concealing. So it's one of each honor and terminal. You can already tell that this is going to be dastardly, right? It's going to be one of each dragon, one of each wind, plus any one additional of any honor or terminal. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. This is a hand known as the 13 Orphans. You can't steal any of these. They're all individual. It's a massively rare hand, but if you can make it work, again, instant Yakuman. This is just scratching the surface of the ideas of what hands are worth more than the others and what hands you may want to go for. But this is where you having some resources is always helpful. And hopefully you can take your time and you can play with your own rules in the grand scheme of things with your friends as long as you agree with the rules. But each of these hands should be treated as more valuable if it's more complex. So you can simplify the rules a little bit with the points, but you can definitely make a whole lot of fun out of it as long as you understand the core concepts of the game. So for this last history break, I wanted to tell you about the thing that you probably are most familiar with these tiles, Mahjong Solitaire. Yes, it actually exists, and it is something you can play physically, uh, but you have to have these wooden contraptions to help you set up for these particular designs. It was included technologically as a part of IBM computers. When they were sort of looking for some games to add on to, they used these rudimentary piece designs and made it into the beautiful structures that you see. Uh, they reached out to a company called Activision, the now large gaming company, to create this. And it was included first on a Windows application in 1990. And ever since then, the pastime that probably wasted so many hours of productivity on computers was born. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. As a reminder, you can always check out our library's YouTube page where you can see all of the previous episodes of this series and so many other great series under our NPL Universe flag. Be sure to check it out. I'll see you next time.